Good morning to everybody. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Today, my presentation is about how to improve and fix problems in mixed farming system uh, in regions with the Mediterranean climate. Uh, this is just a classic scenario where the farmer will, uh, will call and we say, okay, we have a, I'm on a classic uh, sandy uh, of a clay or gravel, uh, duplex soils, and uh, uh, if the soil type are different from uh, other regions around the world, I think the problems uh, that our farmers here in Western Australia, uh, they, share, they will be sharing with uh, uh, a lot of other farmers across the world. But in general, the farmer will say, look, uh, my soil is starting to get a little bit more acidic, um, are starting to develop uh, an art pan, um, I have a low nitrogen. I would like to reduce the cost in um, nitrogen fertilizer. Unfortunately, I have a lot of weeds, weeds, different ones, broadleaf grasses, uh, some of the resistance are starting to develop some uh, nematodes and uh, some other diseases, rhizotonia, root rot. Uh, in general, I have a poor pasture. So I would like to have a, a better pasture, more persistent legume in eventually in the system and feed my sheep in a better way. So uh, that's what I, uh, what I have to face every day. Uh, if we are in a continuous system scenario, we'll have a classic uh, paddock rundown, which the only solution will be to live uh, as a fellow, uh, keep spraying during the year, and uh, hoping the weeds eventually will go. But otherwise, if we are in a mixed farming system, similar scenario, but uh, what they call in pasture, you can see is uh, just a little bit of cape weed, uh, ryegrass and a few other um, just uh, unwanted weeds were not very productive. So how are we going to fix all these problems? So what we're suggesting is a normal uh, textbook will, um, will say, okay, let's go to lime, uh, trying to fix the problem with the acidification, deep ripping, so I'm trying to break the hair pain, and then go back to cropping. Uh, this is a traditional approach, but we're still missing the nitrogen, the weed control, eventually nematode diseases, and we still have a poor pasture if we want to feed our sheep. So how we go about to fix all of this in a more uh, systemic approach? Uh, what we're doing is uh, we're trying to, or we suggest that including the system of a self-regenerating regenerating annual legume that will help us to uh, uh, trying to solve uh, some of the issues that we listed before. So in the past, uh, in Western Australia or across all Australia, um, the only annual legumes that were available in market were subclover and annual medics. Uh, and unfortunately, they had to cover a huge range, a huge area with a different soil type, a different pH. So uh, they were not very well adapted. Uh, and the farmers, unfortunately, had only these two options. Um, Almost 25 years ago, we started a new uh, selection uh, breeding program where we, um, uh, we were able to develop a, a new range of pasture legumes. Um, some of them never heard before, only just by the botanist. Um, somebody would say probably we have too many, but better have a more option than nothing. Uh, so the most important problem uh, when we got this option is the chance trying to find the best legume for us. So which one? Um, for the somebody wants to really go a little bit deeper, there is a paper there where you can read uh, what happened in the past and uh, how we come up with these uh, different legumes. Most important is uh, which one and uh, how to use it accordingly to the uh, scenario, soil type, uh, region, where we're going to address. This is a very simple example uh, where we had a very infertile acidic sandy soil uh, where on the left side, the blue bar are the biomass produced and we have a group of the serradellas, yellow serradella, French serradellas, in the middle, the bias ruler. On the right side, we have the clovers. So the serradella did extremely well, uh, ranging from 10 tons to the six tons, the bias ruler was in the middle, about uh, five tons, but the clovers were not performing very well at all. And in particular, subclover probably was the, the worst of all. Um, the red bars are the pot production, seed production. You can see 
the yellow cerebellar santonini can go up to four and a half tons or more of pods. So nothing wrong with the clovis or with the cerebella. Is uh, it all depends where we're going to use it. So this is the same cerebella that was majestic on the infertile acidic sandy soil, and this is a cerebella pH eight. So cerebella with land doesn't work very well in alkaline soil, but it does extremely well in low pH from four up to seven. And uh, and when we starting to go in a very tough scenario, so tough situation where the rainfall is pretty low. Uh, the Saradella does the best, and there is no any other plant in these particular conditions that will perform as well as the Saradella. As I said, there is nothing wrong with the clover as long as we put in the right soil. So, uh, on better pH, better quality soil, sandy loam, loamy, and clays, the clover they will do extremely well. So, it's extremely important to choose the right species. Now we have a different option for the particular condition that we have in the farm. Now, easy to say um, and to see some of the very nice pictures, but we have to get there. So the most important thing is uh, how we establish this layer. So if we follow the traditional system, uh, we, what we have to do is uh, go to the shop, buy scarify seed and uh, buy the inoculum. But once we're doing that, it's inter starting to interfere with our cropping operation because we do always at the same time. But most of the time, the crops come first and then uh, the soil in our pasture will be delayed. Uh, best scenario is two weeks, but most of the time it could be three to four weeks. So these uh, small uh, seed legumes, they don't like to germinate and grow when uh, at a low temperature in winter. And therefore, they stay pretty miserable for most of the winter um, and uh, missing, so not giving really much productivity. And what will happen is uh, if we have an early finish, uh, they wouldn't set much seed. So it cost a lot of money for achieving not really much at all. Uh, and uh, interfering with our crop operation is really just a, a, some, a big constraint, uh, not considering the high cost. So what we come up is a different system. So what we're doing is uh, we, we call it the summer sowing. So practically outside complete of the crop operation. So at the start of the summer, we take in um, a sample of uh, unscarified seed. In, in this case, the only one that works for us is the bladder clover, Trifolium spumosum, or pods of a hard seed, the French Sagadella. Uh, in our case, we have a margarita is our cultivar. And we are drilling the pods, uh, not too deep, uh, around one centimeter maximum in January, February, after we harvest our cereals, so in the stubbles. So what we're doing is, is practically we letting the pods sit in there to naturally break down the hard seedness that we know exactly how much is uh, for these two particular varieties uh, is around 50 to 60% of the seed pods will become germinable uh, at the end of the summer. So they are completely protect against false breaks. So if we have a rain during Janu uh, January, February, uh, March, most of the seed wouldn't germinate, will come up only just uh, at the end of, of the summer. So when we have a proper break, so the opening of the season, uh, the, the pods and the seed that we drill it in, in the stubble will germinate and will come up. And because they start in a, with the best uh, opportunity uh, and the best temperature, they will start to grow extremely fast and, uh, and will have a very good establishment. Uh, the difference are uh, enormous. Uh, you can watch also a video, i just to put the link over there. But the summer sowing compared to a normal autumn sowing, if there are only two or three weeks of difference, at the end will always come up with a we have been measuring that uh, three to five tons of biomass different. And this is only just because the legume has been able to germinate and then have an early growth when the temperature is still warm. Uh, there is a paper attached here, uh, so where you can have a look a little bit more in detail about the technique, is a new technology and the different species that can be used. Uh, is the system uh, uh, really working everywhere? Uh, we've been testing it across all our uh, wheat belt in Western Australia, 
but it works extremely well in New South Wales on the other side, on the east side of uh, Australia. I've been testing back in the Mediterranean regions uh, and always work. It works um, uh, as long as you uh, follow the golden rules. The first one is the selection of the paddock, which should come up always after the crop or high crop where the weeds are a bit under control. But the most important thing is that we, we, are, we shouldn't be using any sulfonyl ureas like a logram uh, in, uh, in the year before, because what they're doing is on the left side, you can see the plant, uh, it looks normal and not affected from the top. But when we look at the root system, it's completely uh, missing the nodules and the lateral root system is completely pruned compared to a plant on the right side where we can see the nodules, the soil is sticking to the root system and uh, that means the plant is healthy. Another one is the chlorpyralid, uh, uh, we call lontrol over here. Uh, this is uh, the effect on the bias rule on the left, left side, you can see the plant is totally affected compared to the control on the right side. Uh, lontrol is actually even more devastating than uh, uh, logram, glean, or lie, uh, because it can persist up to two or three years and still show uh, the effects on the following pasture. So we've been using, for example, launch or canola followed by wheat. The third year we'll have a basarola, and this is a case where it's still getting badly affected. The most important part of the summer soil is, uh, is the ability to be able to colonize a huge uh, areas in a very short time at the minimum cost. So what we're suggesting is uh, buy a certified seed uh, for a start and have a nursery paddock where the seed or the pods will be bulk up. So for example, if we have a hundred hectares, an average yield will be around 500 kilograms, which will give a per hectare, will give you about 50 tons roughly of a seed yield uh, for the whole paddock. Uh, the summer soil required to sow between uh, 15 to 30 kilograms, taking an average of 20 kilograms of pods per hectare will give us the possibility to sow around 2,500 hectares. This will be impossible, particularly when you see the, the cost in the seed that they will range between five to $10 per hectare to do with any other species. Now, we, we found a way to establish it. Uh, a leg, we choose the, the legume, we find a way to establish in a, in a very cost effective way, but we're still missing you now the, the productivity. We still have to see if we can uh, have this legume to thrive and produce a lot, fix the nitrogen for us, control the weeds and nematode diseases and so on. So we've done this, uh, we've been able to establish the legume including the system, but we're still missing the rest. So let's go um, keep going. Uh, so with the summer sowing, we can have a, a knockdown because we're drilling the seed in, uh, in January, February, leading to break down the hard seed nest and just waiting for the rain for the seed to come up. But what we can do is, uh, particularly with the Saradella, we can use uh, some of the EMI technology. So. Uh, Imanzet appear or spinaca, and uh, we're going to apply the spinaca as a post sowing pre emergent just before the break. You can see the difference between where we apply and the control on this case was a cape weed, but there would be the, a few double G's, and uh, the control is pretty remarkable. Uh, we could have uh, some problem with the grasses, and then what we can do is uh, to the underground so in Imanzet appear, we can add. Uh, some propizamide, uh, one liter, still as a post sowing pre emergent, so trying to create a film, not disturbing the surface, uh, and the cellula will come through and the other weeds will, uh, will die. Uh, the INI technology gives us uh, a very good opportunity to use. Uh, uh, the cellula together. The cellula is the probably of all these legumes, uh, the only one is completely tolerant to the INI. So it's the legume that can follow an imi crop, can be grown together, or we can grow the Saradella with the imi and then follow with the imi tolerant 
crop. In this case, it's originating in stand or cerdel, where we also saw some barley scorp or Spartacus, which is a hemitolerant, and then we spray the spinacase pre emergent. Uh, in this case, we have been, uh, we, we practically eliminating all the unwanted weeds, and we have the Ceradella there as this word based legume, uh, which we, is improved with the companion plant. In this case, we choose uh, uh, the barley, and this will give us a, a better bulk, a better variability in the diet, and so on. Um, this is uh, another an example in a big scale where the farmer had the regenerating stand and uh, just went to drill a 40 kilogram of barley scope and use the spinaca to control uh, the other weeds. The most important, this is probably the most important slide because uh, it's not only just a link uh, in uh, uh, to how successful establish uh, some of these uh, new legumes, but also it's the best way to control the weeds and all the spline. So if we, we saw the legume, and then uh, we let the set seed. Uh, most of the time, uh, in the old cases, a traditionally way, uh, using the subclover, we used to leave uh, the legume to regenerate in second year and they start, or even a third year, and then start a long crop phase. If we do this with the new legumes, we ended up in trouble. There are several reasons. The first one is uh, we suggest in the second line at the bottom, so pasture, let's set seed, then we crop in the second year, let to regenerate again, and let's set seed as a second seed bank, and then we can decide and go ahead with a different crop rotation. In this case, our favorite there will be two crops and one pasture. The reason why we're doing this is because this, these species are a hard seed, so they have to be buried, so the seed will break down and it will regenerate after the crop. The second is that they grow extremely well, they're very well nodulated, so they're fixing a huge amount of nitrogen. The, most of the time, in the first year of pasture, we are able to control only just a, a proportion of the weeds that they were in the paddock. Therefore, in the second year, when we have all the nitrogen, the weeds will go crazy. So we have to really try to use something else to finish the job in cleaning the paddock and let the pasture regenerate in the third year sometimes without using any chemical or sometimes reusing the chemical, but uh, wouldn't be a very uh, weedy situation. If we follow these rules, the success is almost guaranteed. But we have to remember to, uh, is a very important most of the time to crop or to use the nitrogen there to be able to uh, ensure a very good regeneration in the third year and to control the weeds in a better way under the crop. So sometimes the situation are a little bit <clears throat> out of control. So I come up with a classic paddock completely run down with a high seed bank or resistant, for example, resistant grass, but then we'll have all the other broad leaves. So what are the options the farmers face? One in particular in the central north, uh, the the soils, three years of fallow, continuous spray, uh, is the, the only option they have. Uh, to me, it's not probably the best option because it costs a lot of money and we are not really adding much to the system. And uh, most of the time, as soon as we, after three years, we put another crop and we're stirring up a little bit of soil, particularly the sea bank or the rye grass, the world dormant, it will come up again and we are starting again from zero. So what we, this is, uh, we're giving another option is one of the many, but um, using the legume as a tool to try to achieve uh, some of the issues that we had before. So the first year, what we're suggesting is a, is a light cultivation before autumn, if it's possible, trying to maximize the germination of the rye grass has been sitting there for a long time. Apply a double knock, knock down, and uh, using the Ceradella as a species to be included, uh, could it be summer sowing or direct sowing, and uh, with a, uh, then uh, apply a pre-emergent, post-sowing pre-emergent, imazetapir, apropizamide. And then uh, let it grow, 
uh, if we are able to graze it, we can graze it, and then a brown manure in spring. So what we want to achieve is a completely seed set control of the rye grass. So zero tolerance for any seed set. In the second year, what we're suggesting is that we go with the crop. The crop could be wheat, but we're using, for example, Sakura, where we have no resistance. Uh, Sakura plus 1.5 liter of trifurolin is pretty dynamite. Or using a canola, it could be a nimi plus TT toler. So instead to use the spinnaker, we use it with a cerda like the year before. We can use atrazine plus uh, ipropizamide, or, or otherwise uh, Roundup Ready canola plus clitolim in the first spray. So we can really have a very good control on the rye grass. In the year three, we go back with the summer soil Margherita French Cerdella, again with an Imazer Tapir Epropizamide, and if we have to even finish with a wheat wipe. So with the option one, we have three years of spending and not really the classic fellow and not really achieving much, not adding anything to the system. In this case, with the option two, what we're achieving is a we have a very good ryegrass, excellent control. We have a two lots of nitrogen that have been added to the soil because of the legume in the two years. Uh, we managed to grab a crop in, a, in the process and we got two grazing years. And we have a, a partial seed bank established that will be running from uh, for us for free and that we can decide which crop we would like to have. This is uh, if we're using the French Sacadella uh, otherwise, what we can do is uh, we can use the vice rule. Vice rule, a completely brand new species, extremely hard seeded, very persistent. And, um, and when once uh, is in equilibrium, so we have a pasture crop, pasture is regenerating, regenerate in very high numbers, put a huge amount of stress on the weeds, particularly when we have early breaks. And then it's a slightly unpalatable. So practically, the sheep are able to graze uh, out all the weeds. And the Bicerula probably is the only pasture legume that doesn't need any spraying. So the paddock is truly resting and fixing a lot of nitrogen for the following crops. Uh, not only that, this is a classic picture where once the Bicerula has been established, it can tolerate up to five or six crops. And then we can decide which type of rotation we want. Uh, probably, one of the best ways is uh, establish the, the bias ruler and then having three crops in a row where we put a big pressure on the weeds and then uh, let it go when uh, is, uh, is required and the shipper will, uh, will finish it off the business with the bee, with his weeds and we wouldn't have any trouble. All right, so with the weed controller, there are a lot of other tricks, but we don't have the time to explain here. Happy to talk to you anytime. Uh, but we have a lot of other tools, different chemicals, different other strategies that can be used to control some particular other weeds. So one day we wake up in the morning and we have our crop not looking very good, pretty sad. And uh, most of the time, if we start digging the plants, we start to see the root system is completely missing. And uh, we have a bad news. Practically, we have a bad attack on nematodes sometimes can be building up in time, sometimes can be pretty rapid. So what can we do? Uh, we can't really spray, we can't kill the nematodes, so rotation is, uh, is the best thing. This is the graph where on the left side are practically the plants that naturally are suppressing the nematodes, practically stopping the buildup of the, of the, um, of the nastings. And uh, in particular, the French Saradella, Yellow Saradella, the Lupins, the Sula, uh, all uh, species that can uh, help us in reducing dramatically the population of the nematodes. On the right side, we have uh, some susceptible crops, and then the medics, clovers, unfortunately, uh, are not very resistant and uh, propagate the nematodes. So just using one year sardella in a problematic paddock is enough to completely clean or suppress in a very, very high numbers of these nematodes to be able to come back with a crop and not have any trouble. Uh, still a lot of work has to be done. Um, and uh, you can see some of the data, some of the results 
in this uh, uh, GRDC crop update papers that we put over here. So we got the control on nematodes and some of the diseases. So let's go to the next one. This plant, I said, and you know, you've seen it from the photos, they can grow extremely well, but are they really doing well enough to produce uh, enough of biomass to feed our sheep? Well, I don't think we have any trouble with the plants like the Basarula, Cerevelo, Bloody Clover, they're extremely productive. This is, um, was last year. Uh, biomass, total biomass of, of Basarula, around 10 tons. I've been able to measure that even more across all this year since the uh, Bice rule has been released uh, in 1997. Uh, this was with a 250 millimeter growing season. Uh, we have a 2016 200 millimeter growing season. Uh, the Margherita French Serradella, the summer sown, uh, Indian grace scenario, we had a 10 tons and the grace was still five tons left. Uh, this is a uh, I just put this slide because with the project dry land uh, pasture system, uh, we released uh, last year a new uh, early hard seed of French Zardella that despite the earliness is still producing huge amount of biomass. Over here, you think I measure over um, seven tons of biomass, which uh, will fix a lot of nitrogen and will produce a lot of uh, feed for our animals. And some of these uh, new species also can be salage. Uh, this is the farmer where in, uh, in August uh, with this serradella, sometimes adding oats or barley, uh, is cutting also the unwanted weeds, ryegrass, uh, biling and making salage, and then using strategically during the time of a need, early autumn or in the bad years, uh, the salage will last uh, under this uh, condition will last up to three years. The quality of the silage is as good as almost as a lucerne silage. And, um, and, in, and practically is uh, not only just uh, capturing some of these um, excess uh, um, feeder, but is able also to control the weeds. And sometimes the serradella is able to uh, reshoot and, and just add another growth during uh, at the end of the season. Then, uh, as I said before, uh, when we're doing the summer sowing using pods, particularly from French Verdella, uh, that we can really, uh, it's, a, it's a hard process uh, to dehaler and extract the seed. But these pods are uh, full of goodness. And, uh, we did in the past an analysis and uh, the results were pretty outstanding. Uh, they were saying practically they were as good as the looping seed, probably better because they had uh, a better ratio uh, roughage protein. They're still up to around 36 uh, protein in the seed, 25% protein in, uh, in the pod. Uh, so what we can do is, is another option when we have a lot and we are not going to use it because we already established a seed bank in, uh, in, uh, in our farm. What we can use of the pods is a mixing with the barley and the leak feeders, so just a feeder to our animals, strategically when uh, we are short to other, other things. So we're feeding the animals, yes, and we got a productive pasture. Now we have to see how we, we sorted out the problem with the nitrogen. So this is a classic uh, stand, uh, regenerating stand of Barcelona early in the season. Uh, if we are here with a group of farmers, the question I'll ask usually is, uh, are they fixing the nit enough nitrogen for the crop? Are all these uh, species the same? And uh, how many crops can I grow after one year of uh, a legume like this? So uh, practically 30 years of research, they told us that, from the microbiologist, that as long as the plant is nodulated, and uh, you can see from the photo here, the nodules are red, uh, and everything is plain on this uh, uh, wonderful guide that you can download as a PDF from the GRDC uh, webpage. Practically, these, uh, these species can fix a lot of nitrogen. And the amount of nitrogen we can put in a very simple way. So uh, they say that for every ton of very well nodulated legumes, which is in, in, a, in a pretty dense sword, uh, will give us uh, around 20 kilograms of urea 
per ton of biomass produced, and which is around 3%. Now, say we have a five tons of biomass, uh, the background I think is a little bit more than that, but anyway, uh, if we, we're running about 3%, it will give us an equivalent of 100 kilograms of urea available for the next year crop. This will be only just at 30%, and then we will have another 30% for the second year, 30% in the third year. The other important thing we find out is uh, looking at uh, more in details of these different species is that uh, different species have a different proportion of a nitrogen in the tissue. So for example, the subclover is running between 2-2.5%, Cerradella between 3-3.5%, vice rule is extremely high, 4 to 4.5 percent. So the 20 kilograms per hectare of urea equivalent could be around 10 per subclova, 20 for Saradella, and 30, 35 for Bicerula. So it's not only just about the biomass, it's also relate everything about the concentration of nitrogen, which you will reflect in the proteins in the species that we grow. Now, it's really true. Uh, believe it or not, uh, there are not many studies done to prove that there is a benefit in what we're going to put in the box with our following crop, particularly for a new species, and particularly for the second and the third year. A lot of work has been done on grain legumes, but still not for the second and the third year. So what uh, we decided to do was uh, just uh, use a very simple trial to investigate uh, the crop response. So, what I did was looking for a paddocks of any different species from subclover to biosura, balade clover, saradella, and asking the farmer to put a crop with a minimum amount of nitrogen. So I started seven to 10 units of nitrogen and then leaving enough space to put a replicate trial, very simple, where I had the treatment with a no nitrogen with the increasing rates of urea from 50 to 200 kilograms. And uh, the aim of the trial was very simple. If there is no response, means uh, between the different treatments, so the nil nitrogen and uh, the extra urea that we add in, there is no need for any extra nitrogen. So we can save uh, uh, our money. So this, uh, uh, I did uh, many of these different trials in different location. And this is an example, for example, this was a uh, wheat mice in a normal standard um, soil where we had the Serradella, French Serradella growing the year before, uh, which was harvest. But practically, uh, you can see no nitrogen, five tons of 10% protein, and uh, practically there was no response, no significant response uh, increasing the adding any extra nitrogen. So we did a different place, location, different soil type using a Serradella mix. As you can see again, practically no response. Uh, we did uh, also for a bladder clover in difficult soil and bias ruler. Uh, so in the bladder clover, 2.3 tons from uh, no nitrogen and no significant difference with the other increased rate of the urea, and again, was no response across the two trials. Um, canola, um, canola after the Serradella. So you can see the fell on the left and the Serradella on the right side, practically, there was no response uh, in the fellow. As long as we put a add in nitrogen, we have an increase in, uh, in yield. So from 1.2 tons, up to 2.1 tons with a maximum uh, 75 kilogram extra of nitrogen. In the case of uh, the Serradella, we didn't have a no response. Um, so the question, so I think after that, I did uh, several trials across all the wheat belt, different scenario, different pasture legumes. Practically, as long as the legume is not gelated, we are now in extremely poor condition. So in fertile soil, there is no need to add any extra nitrogen with the exception of the five to 10 units with a start, which are always are recommended. The question was, is that what about the second and the third year? Can we really push our rotation without using much nitrogen? 
So what I did was um, I went to a, a place where the, the farmer used to grow a lot of bicerula and uh, had a different, uh, different scenario. So we had the bicerula in the first paddock, which I was able for the first time and was able to uh, uh, put a wheat in 2016 did a soil analysis, 81 gram, kilograms of nitrogen per hectare, yeah, standard. Uh, in the paddock two, I had the bicycle in 2014, followed by canola with a minimum amount of nitrogen was about 20 units, and then wheat. So the total nitrogen there, yeah, was a little bit lower, expected, the canola used a lot, lot of nitrogen. But in the paddock where I had the bicycle in 2013, followed by oats, and then by canola, the nitrogen was pretty, pretty high. So we start to have a question mark on uh, soil analysis, uh, particularly for, for the nitrogen content. So we use uh, the same simple trial. So in the first year, paddock one, we had the bicycle year before, we put our trial on the wheat, practically no response. And you can see the, um, yeah, the yield are pretty remarkable five tons with a 10% proteins, um, but no response practically, no significant response in the yield. So then we went to the second paddock. So bisol in the first year, followed by the canola and then wheat in the same year. And again, no response. I was very worried about the third year. Do we have enough nitrogen to be able to uh, grow a crop of wheat with the yield without adding any nitrogen. In this case, the farmer really didn't want to put even a start. So these three trials didn't have any start, no nitrogen at all whatsoever. We're talking about decent soil, uh, sandy loam, uh, pretty, <clears throat> pretty good soil for our standards. And again, in the third year, yes, the yields were a little bit lower, but still not significant difference between the treatment, so no response. So somebody, I remember telling me that, they. It was like I was lucky, so I felt I was so lucky. So I did it again in a different place. So I was uh, probably about 900 kilometers apart in the southern part of uh, our wheat belt, where the farmer had a classic rotation one to two, uh, medics and wheat and barley. So in the first paddock was a classic a medic the year before, and we put a wheat. In the second paddock, uh, the farmer just to change the rotation for me and include the third crop, barley. As you can see, the, the amount of nitrogen was pretty uh, significant, but very important to know is uh, in our soil, our average carbon percentage of organic carbon is around 5%. In this case, organic carbon was 1.72%, which is pretty rare, but probably this farmer has been doing a very good long rotation with the medics for the last 30 years. So the first uh, trial that we did uh, again was uh, one to one, practically no significant response. So no need of extra nitrogen. In the case of uh, the thir third crop in a row was barley. And again, no significant difference, 5.4 tons of uh, barley for the no nitrogen. And so again, no response. So uh, we fixed the problem with the nitrogen. I think we, we have uh, enough data now and we're still uh, working particularly with a new project, uh, trying to work it out a little bit better, better understand a uh, little bit more in details what, what is going on with the nitrogen uh, and uh, in the different soil type, different different in the region and particular different years. Uh, if uh, there is always enough breakdown of the nitrogen during the summer to allow to grow on a crop and what will happen when we have uh, multiple nitrogen pools for a couple of years where we had uh, our pastures. So in the process when we are just um, looking for the nitrogen, what we come up is uh, digging a little bit more and doing the soil analysis. We find out that the cerdellas, the bicycle and so on, particularly we are not adding only nitrogen. And always I was suspicious about that. And what we find out is uh, in the first uh, zero to 40 centimeters after the cerdella, 
we start to notice that there was an increase in uh, potas potassium contents. So in this case, for example, uh, in a classic uh, uh, deep sand soil, the difference between uh, the level of potassium after the Saradella compared to a fellow were about almost 70 kilograms. Okay, we did again in different place, more uh, duplex soil, so sand over gravel, and almost we found the similar results. So after the legume, compared to a fellow, they were around 50 kilograms extra. We did another place, valley. This was a little bit sandy loam over clay, and there were about almost uh, 60 kilogram of polish extra. So I think we are beyond coincidence. And since then, we've done a lot of other sampling, a lot of different trials. It's almost a constant. As long as the, if the potash is uh, sitting on the critical level between uh, seven, 50 and 70, uh, and deep sand particularly, looks like uh, this uh, potash has been leached to the soil profile. The Cerradella in particular is able to recycle some of the potash to the surface to benefit our crop. So um, this is a classic example where sometimes, you know, uh, there's a cherry on the top of the cake where it's always welcome to have some extra uh, potash, otherwise you have to buy and it will cost a lot of money. So as you can see, uh, we've done a lot of different things, but working for the system, but it's really working. So on just a given example of a sort of impact uh, is, is having a, a sort of approach in a, in a classic uh, our wheat pile farm, just to finalize uh, our talk. So this was a, a farm that contacted me early in 2015 and they decided to improve the system. They knew that the system wasn't uh, resilient enough and they were losing money. So they decided to go ahead and try to do, introduce the legumes and try to control all the other issues. Um, in this particular region, the Cerradella and the Bosch Rula probably were the two best options. So they started to bulk it up 100 hectares of Cerradella to be able to use the pods to propagate the Cerradella in the rest of the farm. So practically within the, uh, the five years, uh, they've been able to establish a seed bank in most of the, the farm, which is over 10,000 hectares. And the results have been pretty outstanding. Uh, considering some of part of the farms were just a late entry and when they bought it, uh, they told them they would never be able to crop it again or even graze it again because the condition were so bad. So uh, I think we did pretty well. Uh, the Saradella was the first entry in some of these paddocks um, and um, we've been able to control the weeds, uh, get established again in legumes, and uh, in this particular paddock it was over 500 hectares. Um, the Saradella was in 2017, barley, then Saradella again, and barley in 2020. Uh, we did again the soil analysis, and here again we saw 70 kilograms of potash recycled over the, the particular in the first uh, 20 centimeters after the Saradella compared to the fellow. But the most important thing was the crop. Uh, it was a pretty handy crop of barley last year, despite the season, because we had only 179 millimeters of growing season. And uh, the paddock was about 500 hectares. It still uh, went for the average uh, yield of 2.7 with a time 10.25% of protein. And the uh, farmers, they use only 20 kilograms of nitrogen extra. And as you can see from the photo, and they had the peaks up to four tons. So uh, results like these are almost, uh, I would say almost impossible, but uh, it's a fact. I don't believe it is only just the effect of the nitrogen here. It's a classic uh, example of uh, a uh, holistic approach uh, in fixing the problem, getting rid of the weeds, improving the soil fertility, and in uh, getting the nitrogen in, in the right quantities, measured by an adequate level of a potash, uh, which is very important uh, for the for the yield, and uh, the organic matter probably left by the Saradella during the years, uh, 
has been able to give a chance to the crop to capitalize on every single millimeter of rainfall, which wasn't much at all they had in, uh, in, in, um, in the particular year. And um, I think I'll, uh, I'll finish over here. Unfortunately, we can't have any questions, but you can find me on the web and um, I'll be happy to help and to have a chat with any of you uh, anytime via email, via WhatsApp or whatever. Thank you very much again for the invitation. It's been a pleasure. See ya.